Church, I think it's so important we keep acknowledging the season that we're in. We are in a season of grief and of loss. And I'm feeling the effects of it. I'm sure many of you are feeling the effects of it. And we can't just sweep it under the rug and pretend it's not there. So I changed up my plan for the sermon today because I felt like we needed a reminder of where our hope truly lies, especially in difficult seasons. And I think if we're honest, if I'm being honest, when life is difficult, our longing is that life would just get better, right? I just want things to get easier and better. And the truth is, the rub is, sometimes life does not get better in the here and now. And I think it's so important we re remember that our ultimate hope isn't in this life getting better now. It isn't what happens on this earth. But our ultimate hope is really in the life to come. So that's where we're headed this morning with the message. And I pray the message would really encourage you, encourage us as believers in Jesus Christ, that we have a glorious future that awaits us. And that gives us hope for today. I want to take a poll. If you could spend a day on the beach or in the mountains, which one would you choose? How many people would choose the beach? Raise your hand. I don't know. <laughs> you decide. Okay, let me see hands. Hands. Okay, that's a pretty, okay. How many mountains? Okay, I think beach definitely wins on that poll. I've wrestled with this question for a long time because I love the beach. I love the mountains. But I would lean towards the mountains. And growing up, our family, we would often go to Estes Park, Colorado, which is right at Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, the entrance and one of the features of Rocky Mountain National Park is Trail Ridge Road. It's this road that ascends through the mountains and it elevates to up to 12,000 feet and you get some incredible views of the Rocky Mountains. And our family was on vacation in Estes Park one year and we're making the trip up Trail Ridge Road. And, and you have to understand that there are parts of this road where there are sheer drop-offs on both sides. Drop-offs of like thousands of feet. So even though I like the mountains, I am terrified of heights. Okay. Anybody else terrified of heights? Okay. A few. And, and when I'm in a car, my fear of heights intensifies. Especially if I'm not driving because I feel like I'm out of control. So this moment, I wish I could say I was five years old, but I was probably like 12 years old. We're driving along on Trail Ridge Road as we're going up, man, my fear is off the charts. And I hit a breaking point. I am in the back of the, our minivan, and I'm lying on the floor. My eyes are closed, and I start crying and yelling at my dad. I wasn't cussing him out, but I was yelling at my dad, Dad, why are you trying to kill us? Why are you trying to end my life right now? I was that afraid. I thought my dad was going to drive us off the road and I was going to die in that moment. And it was an unforgettable moment for our family and funny for everybody else, but not for me. So fast forward many years later, Ivana and I had the amazing opportunity to go on a mission trip to Costa Rica with our small group. And on one of the last days of that trip, we went zip lining in the Costa Rican rainforest. And in one of the last zip lines, we were way up high, kind of like that. And, and the zip line went probably for 30 to 45 seconds over the top of the rainforest. And you know what? I kept my eyes open this time. And I embraced the moment. It, it was one of the most unforgettable moments in my life. It was filled with just awe and wonder. So the Rocky Mountains, Costa Rican rainforest, two beautiful places, two places high up and elevated, yet two completely different experiences. One experience filled with terror and fear, the other filled with joy and exhilaration, all because of my perspective. 
all because of where my focus was at in the moment. So in all that our church is going through right now, it's so important that we have the right perspective. And I want to suggest this morning that many of us, including myself, are often missing out one of the best parts of the Christian life right now because of a matter of perspective. Because of where our eyes, our hearts, and our minds are focused. And I believe the Word of God is going to remind us this morning to shift perspective. And if we do, it's going to be so good for our souls. It's going to not only help us keep going in this life, but it's going to fill us with hope that we need today. So this morning, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Colossians 3. We're jumping into the middle of a letter that Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. So I want to give a couple highlights from the previous portions of this letter that are so rich and such important truths leading up to the passage that we're looking at today. So at the beginning of the letter, Paul writes this about Jesus in Colossians 1. Jesus, the Son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus is the Lord of all. Jesus is supreme over all things. He is the creator. And it also says here that in him, all things hold together. In Christ, right now, everything in the universe is being held together. Jesus is central to everything in our world. And Jesus is central to what is possible for human beings because a little bit later in Colossians 2, it says, When you were dead in your sins and in the circumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. We were dead spiritually spiritually helpless and hopeless. But through the cross of Jesus Christ, and when we acknowledge our need for Jesus, God does what only God can do. God makes us alive spiritually. God forgives us our sins. He cancels our debt. And so when a person encounters Jesus, who is the supreme ruler over the universe, that person's life is flipped upside down forever. Jesus makes an unbelievable difference right now for us and also for eternity, which is what we're going to talk about this morning. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This morning, I want to share just two kind of main truths for us from this passage. Two things that give us hope today, no matter what we're going through. And the first one is Jesus creates a new eternal reality and focus for his people. Christ creates a new reality for us and a new focus. Verse 1, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Since you have been raised with Jesus Christ. As Christ has been risen from the dead, the greatest moment in human history, so we too have been raised with Jesus. 
We've been given a new beginning, a radical new life because of our union, our connection, our relationship with Jesus. And this is a life-altering, drastic, forever kind of change for us. And this change matters forever. There's a new eternal reality for us who know Christ. And because of this new reality, we're called to a new focus. Set your hearts on things above. So this verb to set refers to the orientation of a person's will. What a person will pursue, our drive, our ambition in this life. And we often esteem and applaud people who have great ambition for worldly things. But Paul is talking about an ambition for things above. And we'll get there in a moment to what that means. But one of these things above is Christ himself. It says, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Christ is seated right now in a position of honor and authority and power in the heavenly realms. And we, we need to remember who we're dealing with when we talk about Jesus. He is the Most High. And when we're united to Him, that means we belong to the one who has ultimate authority and power over this world. Verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Paul's being repetitive here to emphasize the point. First, set your, set your hearts on things above. Now set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So earthly things. In our humanity, we often focus on what is tangible, what is visible. And we make what is tangible and visible the main thing too often. And the problem with this is we get fooled into thinking that what we see is all there is. That what our eyes behold, what we can touch, what we can experience on this earth is all there is. And so we make our lives about those things. We set our minds and our hearts on earthly things. And, and this could be our ambition for material things. It could be our drive for status and achievement. Our obsession with how we look and feel. Our desire for comfort and pleasure. And all these earthly things can easily create a this is it mentality. This is all there is. What you see is it, nothing more. And this is not unique to us. This has been a struggle throughout human history. The Apostle Paul even addressed this back in biblical times. In writing to the Corinthian church, Paul says, if this is it... If the visible world is all there is, if there is no resurrection, no life to come after this, Paul says then, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Just enjoy the moment. Live for this world. Without the resurrection, we might as, just, we might as well just live for today. Because that's all you got. But church, I want to remind us this morning, this is not it. This visible world is not all there is. There's more than we, than we can see. There's more than what we can touch. And may God help us today to realize there is more. God is calling us to set our minds and hearts on things above. So what does that mean? First, I don't think it means we live with an escapist mentality and forget this world completely. We have real lives, right? We have real responsibilities on this planet. Yet in the daily grind of our lives, what this means is we keep looking to Jesus. We pursue our relationship with Christ above earthly pursuits. We think about Jesus often. We seek him for help and strength every day. We live to please Christ and honor him rather than living for worldly things. We show Jesus that he truly comes first in our lives. And the second thing is we live with an eternal perspective 
regarding the circumstances of our life in this world. Because of Christ, our aims and our ambitions are changed. Because we're not just thinking about the here and now. We consider eternal things. And it affects how we view, uh, view trials in difficult times because we know that they're temporary. One day, church, all the struggles will end. There'll be no more suffering and pain. And Jesus will make everything right. And I believe too often we're missing this eternal perspective. We're missing out on the tremendous hope that's available to us right now when we set our minds and our hearts on things above. And I confess, I get too sucked into the here and now, thinking that what I see is it. So we need each other's help to keep reminding us that this is not it, there's more. And from a spiritual perspective, it is foolish for us to keep clinging to our old earthly life after we have been raised with Christ. That's the point that Paul's trying to make in verse 3. He says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now, to be clear, Paul is writing to people who are alive in the moment. So when he says, For you died, he's not talking about physical death here. He's talking about we have died to the old way of life that's centered on ourself, centered on our sin. That old life is gone. It died when we came to Christ. So that means we have a new life with Jesus. It's already started. Eternity has already begun for those who know Jesus Christ. And when it says your life is now hidden with Christ in God, this new life with Jesus is secure. It's protected by God. You are safe in Christ forever. Some of my most favorite moments in this life has been witnessing someone get baptized. It's such a powerful moment to watch a person declare, my old life is gone. I belong to Jesus now forever. And I'm standing up here and I'm testifying that I want to follow Jesus for the rest of my days. When a person goes under the water... It's symbolic that their old life is buried. It's gone. And when they come out of the water, it's symbolic. Their new resurrection life has begun because they've been raised with Jesus Christ. So many years ago, I had the opportunity to baptize my brother. And I'll be honest, I held him under a little longer <laughs> than you're probably supposed to hold him under. And I wasn't trying to drown him. <laughs> I was trying to remind him his old life has died. It's no more. His new life with Jesus has begun. We need to keep remembering our old life where it's all about us. It's all about earthly things is dead. The new resurrection life has already started. And because of this, we set our minds and our hearts on things above. Jesus creates a new eternal reality and focus for his people. That's the first point. Second point is for those of us who belong to Jesus, a glorious day and future is coming. Church, for those who belong to Jesus, a glorious day is coming for us. Verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears... Then you also will appear with him in glory. Church, we need to keep remembering a day is coming when Jesus will return. Jesus Christ is coming back. It's fact. It is truth. One day he will return and he will be fully revealed to all peoples and all creation as the true and glorious king. This is our great hope. And it says right here, when Christ returns, you also will appear with him in glory. In glory. We get to share in the amazing glory of God. If you're a follower of Jesus, our future together is glorious. 
We have no idea how amazing and incredible our forever is going to be. It will be better than we can imagine. A, a few years ago, I read John Eldridge's book, All Things New, Heaven, Earth, and the Restoration of Everything You Love. And it was so inspirational. It was so hopeful. And the whole book is about our glorious future when God restores all things. That God's going to make everything right. And a lot of what I'm going to share next is influenced by this book. But Eldridge writes, How we feel about our future has enormous consequences for our hearts now. If you knew that God was going to restore your life and everything you love one day, if you believed a great and glorious goodness was coming to you, not in a vague heaven, but right here on this earth, you would have a hope to see you through anything. You would have an anchor for your soul. It's so important we keep thinking about our eternal future now. It anchors us in this life. And it reminds us, even if life on this planet doesn't get better, we have a future hope to cling to. And I want to talk about a few of the incredible joys that await us. And I want to start by reading Revelation 21. It talks about what God is going to do in the future to this world. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. So the more I have studied scripture, the more I believe this about heaven. That heaven right now, heaven in this very moment, is a temporary holding place until what happens in Revelation 21. It says right here in Revelation 21, the first heaven... And the first earth will pass away. They will be no more. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And many refer to this as the new creation. That when Christ returns, it ushers in the new creation. A new heaven and a new earth. So this earth that we know now has elements of beauty, no doubt. But it's very broken. Very dark. What God promises to do in Revelation 21 is he's going to renew and restore the earth to a perfect and glorious place. So I would speculate the new earth is going to be more familiar to us than we would expect. If God restores the earth as how it was meant to be in the beginning, there will be a bunch of things that we've experienced now yet in its imperfected form. So imagine this earth being fully restored to perfection. And you have the opportunity to travel this world like you've never been able to do in this life. To explore the wonders of this world in places you wish you could go right now. Beaches, mountains with no fear of heights, animals, all the other amazing features of planet earth. Think about the joy in discovering and exploring the vastness of a perfected earth, a renewed earth. Imagine the opportunity to learn and enjoy music and art and craftsmanship and learning in an uninhibited way. I have very limited musical skills, as you all know, if you know me well enough. But I believe in the new heavens and the new earth, I'll be able to enjoy music and maybe be a little better than I am right now. Imagine being able to run and play in a perfected body. No more aches and pains. Your body fully restored in a new heavenly body. And Revelation 19 talks about the wedding feast of the Lamb. Isaiah 25 also speaks about the new creation. When it talks about the Lord preparing a feast of rich food the best of meats and the finest of wines. I believe there will be food in the new creation. And if you're a foodie, you haven't tasted anything yet. Imagine being able to eat freely and enjoy the most wonderful foods. And no more diets anymore. A 
It's all gone forever. We have a glorious future that awaits us in the new heaven and the new earth. But there's more, continuing in Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. So a lot of pain in this life is due to relationships. Lack of relationships, imperfect relationships, broken and painful relationships. And in our glorious future, relationships will have no more pain. No more brokenness. They will be renewed and restored to perfection. And honestly, we're so used to imperfect relationships, I think it's hard to imagine having perfect community. But on that day, relationships will be brought to a place of harmony and wholeness and unity. And all people who know Christ will, be, will experience being part of a perfect family. You know, one of the things I've learned to accept in this life is life is seasonal and transient. People who have passed away or people have moved far away that I don't, I don't get to see anymore. And if they know Jesus, I can't wait to be reunited. And for all the reunions that, that are going to happen in the new creation. And there are people I can't wait to meet, like Moses and Joshua and the Apostle Paul hearing their stories of what happened here on this earth. I can't wait to meet relatives that I hardly knew, didn't get a chance to really know them. My mom had two miscarriages when I was a kid. So I believe I will get to meet my brother and sister for the first time in the new creation. There's so much to look forward to, the reunions and the community that we will share together. And finally, the greatest thing, for those who know Christ, the greatest joy of this life, of the life to come, is that you will come face to face with your maker. You will stand before the most awesome and glorious and holy being. And you will come before our great God. And you will behold him in the fullness of his glory. And you will experience the full weight of of his love for you, his compassion, his, his tenderness for you, and all that has been broken in you will be made whole, completely restored, and you will know peace and acceptance and grace like you have never known before. We will experience an untainted joy when we come before God face to face. God himself is our greatest reward and promise. Church, that glorious day is coming. That glorious day is not far off. So what do we do with all this now? I want to offer a couple practical next steps. First, we got to live with hope now. We have to live with hope now. Again, our hope isn't in this life getting better. Pain and suffering might not go away. But our hope is in our eternal future. And it's so important that we cling to our eternal hope every single day. And our hope for our future gives us urgency to make the most of our time on this earth. C.S. Lewis once said this, If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world, they have become so ineffective in this. What he's saying is the same thing that Paul says in Colossians 3. Set your minds and your hearts on eternal things. Invest your lives now in what will remain forever. And people 
and our relationships are what matter most for eternity. So we live with hope every day by loving God and loving people as best we can. And helping other people know there is hope beyond this life. There's hope that's available in and through Jesus Christ. That's how we build our lives on what will last for eternity. Love God. Love people. Live with hope every single day. The second thing, I've heard people talk about taking mental vacations. Have you heard this? You take like five minutes in your day and you think about a place like Hawaii and you imagine being on the beach and you just kind of escape from this current world. And just go there mentally take a vacation. Well, I think we need to do something similar in thinking about our eternal future, the new creation, to have new creation moments. So you find a moment throughout your day and you stop and think about your eternal future. Your body won't ache anymore. So you think about that one day. I'm going to be given a whole and perfected body. One day I imagine myself running through the mountains of the new creation. You think about your relationships in the new creation, all the pain and the brokenness right now. It's going to be restored and perfected. You're going to live in complete harmony with other people. And then you think about your relationship with God. As much as we pursue Him now, to be able to see Him face to face, and behold the glory of God. We stop and we take moments to think about our eternal future. And there's a lot of great songs out there that will help us do this. Songs like, I Can Only Imagine, by Mercy Me. There Will Be a Day, by Jeremy Camp, or Phil Wickham's Hymn of Heaven. These songs speak about our eternal future, the hope that we have. Church, we need to be intentional and learn to set our minds and hearts on things above now. You know, many graduation speeches, the person will use the phrase in their speech, the best is yet to come. Probably the most well-known phrase in a graduation speech, the best is yet to come. And that's true for us as followers of Jesus. The best is truly yet to come. Our eternal future is going to be amazing. And that gives us hope for today. If we live with an eternal perspective, we can find hope today, even in the most difficult and challenging circumstances. So church, I want to charge us to set our minds and hearts on things above. Let's pray. God, so often we look at our world, we look at our circumstances, and we believe the lie. This is it. This is all there is. We get so sucked into the pain and the darkness, the chaos of this world, that we lose sight of what is true. that our lives on this earth will one day end and eternity awaits us. And that's why it's so important that we get clear where we're at in our relationship with you. That there's clarity that we've responded to what your son Jesus has done for us. Because Jesus freely gave up himself to die for our sins to pay the debt we could not pay and it's through the sacrifice of Jesus and us putting our hope in Jesus that gives us an eternal future with you I know many of us already responded to what your son has done for us. And so we give you thanks that we have a hope in you that nothing or no one can take away from us. So I pray for us, God, that we would set our hearts and our minds on eternal things, on 
Jesus and the hope that we have in Christ. That we would remember the trials and the struggles of this life are not forever. They are temporary. And one day the promise will hold true that Jesus said he's going to make everything new. Everything will be made right. Everything will be restored. And God, we long for that day. So we say, come, Jesus, come. But until then, God, live, help us to live with passion and strength to honor you, to love you and to love people, and to live for eternal things here and now. And God, we need your help. We need your strength. So we cling to you. God, turn our eyes towards you. Help us to remember what's coming for us on that glorious day. And may now we praise you, God, through these songs. May we exalt you and give you thanks. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.